Hi there, I'm your host Macaulay Tucker and you're listening to The Macaulay Tucker Show, the podcast where I sit down with some of the most accomplished and fascinating individuals in the entertainment and business industry. From celebrities to industry leaders, our guests offer unique perspectives and inspiring stories that will educate and inform you. Join me as I sit down with my next guest to cover their humble beginnings, challenges they faced, as well as their accomplishments in life. You are bound to learn something new, so sit back and enjoy the interview. Hey everybody, today on another episode of the Macaulay Tucker Show, we'll be speaking with Ted Eccles. Ted Eccles was an actor in the 60s starring in shows like Lassie, The Three Musketeers, even um, tons of other projects like including the voicing the iconic character of the Little Drummer Boy in the Little Drummer Boy uh, Christmas classic. Uh, he uh, then went on to work on Disney uh, trailers and tons of other things, and now he's an executive producer. He even worked in creating the iconic lightsaber for Star Wars. So yeah, sit back and enjoy the interview. Um, it seems you began your career as an actor at a very, very young age. So I'm just curious to know the story behind it. Simply, how did you get started in Hollywood? My mom was close friends with the lady who ran a child's agency for uh, an agent by the name of Lola Moore. In the 50s in Hollywood, there were only three agents who represented children to television and movies. Uh, there was a lady by the name of Dorothy Day Otis. She had a pretty robust roster of child actors and actresses. Um, my agent's name was Lola Moore. Lola Moore was uh, a very famous character on uh, movie studios and uh, TV networks. And to be honest with you, I've forgotten the name of the third agent, but there were three. Um, Lola uh, had contacts all over Hollywood and at every network. And so my mom, uh, whose friends, her name was Hilda, and Hilda ran Lola's office. And apparently, by the time I was about six months old, um, I was fairly cute and I didn't cry a lot. And so when they needed babies on sets, they wanted uh, children who had hair. Fortunately, I still have hair. And as a little kid, I had hair. Um, and I smiled a lot and I didn't cry. So I was frequently cast from the time I was just about six months old until I was a year and a half as a baby in arms. And my very first appearance on television, it's kind of ironic. Uh, there was a show on NBC back in those days that was called Matinee Theater. And it was a famous daytime show. They attempted to do hour long dramas every single day of the week. It was a massive undertaking. But uh, I was in an episode of Matinee Theater um, and it was called One for the Road. And the person who played my father was a young Hollywood actor by the name of Peter Hansen. Mm -hmm. The reason that's kind of ironic is that 20 years later, when I was on General Hospital, which was the last series I did as an actor, Peter Hansen was my father. Oh. He yeah. played a character on General Hospital for a period of 20 years. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I just found it ironic. Uh, of course, I don't remember the very young Peter Baldwin because I was literally six months old. But that's how I got started. And by the time uh, I was four, talking parts were frequently uh, coming my way because I was really fast at learning lines and I was well behaved around adults. I smiled a lot. I took direction well. And in television and movies, there were always marks on the floor where the actors were supposed to stand because the lighting was very specific for certain locations. So there were two uh, tests of whether or not a kid actually could make it in Hollywood, aside from the ability to deliver lines convincingly. You had to be able to hit your mark and find your key light. 
uh, in the early days of my career, the film stocks that were used uh, were very slow. And so they had to pump a lot of light on the actors and you always had a key light. Today, as I'm talking to you, my key light comes from this side. But uh, you wanted to make sure as an actor that someone wasn't shadowing your key light. And so if you had the instinct to be able to find your key light on a set, and you could repeat your lines and hit your mark, you got a lot of work. And that's my story. That's really beautiful. And it's and I remember looking through your recent like looking through the stuff that you've been in. It's just truly incredible to see all these amazing projects. And the fact that you started out at a young age, I know talking with a lot of people, being a child actor is is can be difficult at times. You don't know if you're gonna be successful. One of my guests was a uh, who had the opportunity to voice a a character uh, in a Disney film. And you know, that was his big thing. And then after that, you know, he just went on to live, you know, I guess you could call a regular life. And so following your journey, there's there's so many projects. There's a lot of really cool projects that you've been involved in. I was showing my, my grandparents uh, through your IMDb, just showing, you know, these are the projects that Ted has been in and like, oh, I recognize that. Oh, I recognize that. And so there's just so many cool, cool projects. But I want to specifically talk about uh, three in particular, but I'll first start with these two that really stood out to me. It was The Little Drummer Boy and also My Side of the mountain uh through research i found out that my side of the mountain you played the main character in that film which is super super cool um and just also the little drummer boy as well you were in that as well you voiced a main character too i just wanted to hear you know in my side of the mountain and the little drummer boy both characters undergo you know transformative transformative journeys one in the wilderness and one in music um drawing from your personal experiences during these projects i'm curious to know how immersing yourself in these roles impacted your own journey of self-discovery and personal growth? Uh, were there any moments where you found parallels from between the character's journeys and your own life? Well, there is uh, a parallel in a way between the two characters that I played in My Side of the Mountain and The Little Drummer Boy. Both characters um, love animals and are surrounded by animals. Aaron in The Little Drummer Boy is accompanied on his journey by his pet camel, his donkey, and his sheep. Mm -hmm. And Sam Gribley, the character I played in My Side of the Mountain, goes almost everywhere with his pet raccoon Gus and his falcon Frightful and a host of other uh, animal friends who live around his tree in the Laurentian Mountains of Quebec. Behind me is a picture that the producer of my Side of the Mountain gave me, mm. uh, which is me as Sam Gribley flying the Falcon Frightful, an amazing experience at any age, but as a very young teenager to be trained to fly and hunt falcons uh, in the forest and in the wilderness outside of Montreal was an amazing, amazing experience. The Total experience of my side of the mountain was life-changing, was transformative. I spent almost a year uh, in the eastern townships of Quebec where the movie was filmed. After that, I went to London for over a month and lived in the Dorchester Hotel. Elizabeth Taylor's chauffeur was my driver. Uh, we were re-recording much of the soundtrack at Pinewood Studios that Paramount owned in London. Um, being able to experience London in the 60s as a 13 year old boy, uh, you know, the Beatles are dominating the charts, Donovan. Uh, it was just, it was probably the coolest place on earth, at least as far as I was concerned. And I was right down in the middle of it. So. It was a fabulous experience. And when the movie was finished, Paramount sent me out on the road for about six weeks to promote the film. And we went to over 30 cities in that six weeks where I was doing junkets, uh, appearing at high schools on TV three or four times a day. It was the, the standard uh, road show to promote a film. And just getting to see the United States um, as a 13-year-old boy 
was a remarkable experience, especially uh, with a raccoon on my shoulder and a falcon on my hand. Most people don't get to experience the world that way, and I did. And it was a truly amazing experience. Um, one side note, I was hired uh, to be in that film by a producer by the name of Robert Radnitz, who had an office on the lot at Paramount. I was 12 years old when I was hired to do the movie. Seven years earlier, um, I was hired to do a Debbie Reynolds movie on the lot at Paramount by a director at the time by the name of Gower Champion, who had the exact same office that Robert Radnitz did. And years later, when I was hired by Paramount to supervise the trailer department, the person I interviewed with had that same office. When I went into that office for the third time, I laughed because not only did I know the man who was interviewing me, who incidentally was the assistant editor on that Debbie Reynolds film, but as I walked in the same office, I just smiled and I thought, well, I know I have this job because every time I walk in here, I get hired. Um, a little bit about uh, the little drummer boy. Mm -hmm. The most important thing I learned from that uh, role is that I should never attempt to sing. Mm -hmm. I was cast immediately on my, I, I went in for an audition. The offices uh, for the, this company, Saul Bass was a famous animator. He did many of the main title sequences for the early James Bond films. Uh, he, his partner, uh, Rankin, Rankin Bass were legends in Hollywood. They had this very cool office on Seward Street, right in the middle of Hollywood. And I went in and I went into a voiceover booth, not very different from the one you're sitting in right now, Macaulay, mm -hmm. except I don't think we had a voice screen in front of the mic in those days. <laughs> those big blimp uh, foam jobs so that we wouldn't pop our peas when we talked. But um, I read probably three pages and then there was a long pause and they asked me to step out of the booth for a minute and they apparently called my agent and made a deal on the spot to have me voice the character of Aaron and then they said to me we have a few more pages we'd like you to read and I read the entire script in about an hour mm -hmm. um, I had the good fortune to meet Greer Garson who was coming in she is the narrator of that story and uh, she was a beautiful, beautiful lady. And I was this little kid and I was sort of in awe because I knew who Greer Garson was. And I thought it was just an interview that went well. Mm -hmm. Well, when I got home, uh, my agent had called my parents and said, well, Teddy's the voice of the little drummer boy. They have a song they want him to sing. It's called, Why Can't the Animal Smile? Now, Earlier, uh, I had done a series of episodes on the Lucy show, and one of them involved me being in a boys choir singing. And my voice was so loud and so off key that mm -hmm. I had been asked to lip sync in that role. And I didn't think much of it, but I always knew I really didn't have a very good singing voice. Mm -hmm. So when I went back two weeks later to record the song, for the little drummer boy. Thank goodness I'd already been hired and I think paid. <laughs> they heard me sing and I sung like the first, maybe the first couple of bars and there was a silence, they stopped the music. There was a conference outside the sound booth and I was told that was it, I didn't need to do anymore. And I was sent home and there was a character on television, a little animated character. It was actually um, kind of a stop motion pixelated character for a, for a commercial product called Alka-Seltzer. And mm. Speedy Alka-Seltzer was this little guy who ran around and got rid of your heartburn very quickly. And he was voiced by a midget. And this midget 
was able to do an almost exact copy of my voice. So the song in the show, The Little Drummer Boy, that is sung by Aaron, is not me singing. Hmm. And so after that, I decided uh, probably best for my professional career and for audiences everywhere that I not attempt to sing. <laughs> That's really interesting, your story. I know you mentioned earlier when you were answering that question, you know, that office situation where the office was the same office. And I find that when you're in Hollywood or in any career for a specific specific amount of time, you run into people that you knew from like a while back. And that's one of the, the really, really awesome experience because you're able to connect, you're able to catch up, but you're also able to meet new people in every situation. And, you know, The Little Drummer Boy, that that film was amazing. And uh, I hadn't really had any idea that you were the voice of The Little Drummer Boy in that film. And so it's really cool to see that you're able to go into all these projects and um, try new things. You uh, sent me a PDF of, uh, I guess, one of the pages in your book that you're writing. And I was reading it I'm like, this is so cool. And I even uh, watched the specific scene that you were in in this film. And it's uh, In Cold Blood. And this this was super this was this was super cool. Just watching the watching specifically this scene that you were in and just watching it. It was like watching kind of like uh just something from a long time ago. And the way that it looked, it was just like, wow, this is so beautiful. But I wanted to ask you about this. You know, you were so lucky enough to be part of this captivating film, which provides you with the opportunity to meet remarkable individuals, including the creator of the story. You know, as we dwell dive into your acting years i'd like to explore this you know this further you know in this film you had the remarkable chance to collaborate with some amazing people and i would love to ask you you know was there any uh examples of uh growth and lessons that you learned from observing uh these people you know playing these roles and even yourself being in this experience well even as a as a kid i was 12 when i was on the set of a cold blood and I was aware, even at 12 years old, that this was an extraordinary group of people. The director of photography on that film, <coughs> excuse me, Conrad Hall, I'm not sure if this was his first film, but if it wasn't, it was one of his first films. Um, a massive, incredible talent. His career um, went on for decades, an Academy Award winning, just master craftsman, who, as it would turn out later in my life, uh, I married uh, the girl of my dreams, who was uh, my sweetheart in high school, and her father was a, a really well-known cameraman who was close friends with Conrad Hall. Mm. And I met Conrad Hall as an adult, and had an entirely different perspective on in cold blood and on his work. But I could tell just from the caliber of people assembled on that set, this was not just your everyday Hollywood crew. Um, there was a kind of wild electricity in the air. It was incredibly windy uh, out in the desert outside of Las Vegas at, at the time of year that we shot. Uh, Richard Brooks, the director, was wild and screaming at everyone. I mean, here's this crazy British madman with short cropped hair who doesn't have a low, quiet register to his voice. He's either got screaming or not talking. And he just screams the whole time. And it makes people incredibly edgy but it also infused a lot of the performances with this element of danger and electricity. And in the midst of all this yelling and screaming, I'm introduced to Robert Blake, who was a child actor. He, he, his family came from New Jersey when he was a little kid and he was cast in the Our Gang series. And I remember he took me aside and he said, don't worry about all this screaming. Just, we're, we're just going to put it all away. Mm -hmm. And everything that we do is just us. So just tune it out. That's not the real world. Our characters are the real world. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I, I thought a lot about that advice. Um, I don't think I ever became as good an actor as uh, Robert Blake was, but he had a way of inhabiting his characters 
uh, and just, it was as if that was the real world. Later on, when we were done shooting, I remember him taking me aside and he asked me how much they were paying me to be in this part. And I said, gosh, I think I'm getting $500 a day. And he said, that's incredible. When I was six, they were paying me $27 a day. You've come a long way. And that was kind of, you know, mm -hmm. actors talking shop, but he treated me like I was a peer, not like I was a little kid. There was no condescension. Um, I was dismayed to hear later in his life about the events that took place. But from my experience with Robert Blake, uh, he was a, a, an actor's actor and really cared about the craft. And, uh, at the end, I think I shared this with you in the story that I sent you, but at mm -hmm. the end of one of uh, our days of shooting out in the desert, and each time I would go on camera, a prop person would come over with a bag of a very special kind of dirt called diatomaceous earth, which is this really powdery kind of light brown soot that sticks to you. And they wanted me to look like I'd been out on the road for weeks. And believe me, after being dusted all day by this bag of dirt, I did look like that. Mm -hmm. And so as a child, I had to be back at the hotel at a certain hour or the production company paid a penalty. Mm -hmm. So they hurried me into one of the production vans and drove at breakneck speed back to the Sands Hotel, which I can tell you in the mid 60s was also just like Carnaby Street in London, the Sands Hotel in the late 60s was about as cool a place as you could be. The Rat Pack were playing, uh, the people hanging around the crap tables and the pool deck just they all look like movie stars mm -hmm. and I walk up to the front door in these tattered clothes covered with dirt and I don't think twice because I haven't seen myself and I try to walk into the hotel and this arm grabs me in a deep gravelly voice uh, who's the security guard slash bouncer says hey kid you can't go in here looking like that and I suddenly looked up and I realized, oh, I'm not gonna get into the hotel. And I feel another hand on my other shoulder and this very high pitched voice. And it's Truman Capote who says, it's okay, he's with me. And we walked straight into the hotel and the security guard was kind of gobsmacked, but in we went. And one lesson I learned from that about Hollywood is that uh, it very much matters the company you keep. Exactly. And, you know, that's amazing. So I really cannot wait. I think you're working on a book about that, I, I believe. Am I correct? About everything? A series of stories, yeah. Okay. And lessons learned over uh, a, a very long roller coaster ride through mm -hmm. Hollywood. I'm really excited for that. Like, I'm definitely eager to to read that. And when that, whenever that comes out, like, that sounds super exciting. And reading what you sent me, like, that that just sounds such a – you're very lucky to be in that experience. And I really, you know, people dream about being able to be in that experience. And you were very fortunate enough to be in that situation. And you've also been lucky enough to be in tons of other projects over the years that you could spend so much time talking about. But I wanted to cover – specifically those three because those really stood out to me i mean there's a, a there's a bunch of others like lassie and the three musketeers that stood out but those in particular i'm like i would love to to ask you about that um i'm not sure how the timeline goes but i'll just do it in this order um sure. after acting uh I, you sent me a bit of stuff about what you did one thing this really stood out for me i've stood out to me for some reason i don't know why but you worked in from my understanding special effects and main titles. I don't know exactly what main titles means, but one of the things that popped out was Star Wars, the first Star Wars. And is it from my understanding that the main, were, were you involved? I want to ask you this. Were you involved in the creation of the iconic scrolling text in that Star Wars? I wasn't. I was okay. involved in an equally iconic part of the film. Okay. And I'll tell you that story. Um, at about... 20, 
I had died twice, 21 actually, in my 21st year, I died the second time on General Hospital. Mm. The first time I died, the show was on ABC daytime and it was on for a half hour. And I was really burned out doing that show. And I was doing anything I could to get behind the camera. And so I asked the producers to let me out of my deal because I had an opportunity to become an assistant camera. And they said, sure, we'll let you out. And a week later, ABC announced that General Hospital was going from a half hour to an hour. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they needed every character they had developed for the last two years to fill the extra half hour. And they told me, we're sorry, we can't let you out. Mm -hmm. So this deal that I'd worked out to become an assistant cameraman went away because I had to stay on the show another couple of months. And in that second run on the show, I died a second time. We kept saying, I, you got to let me go. Okay. Really, this is just not my thing. You just got to let me go. And graciously, they did. But the only job that I could find where I could get into the camera union since my first opportunity had passed was working at a special effects company because in the early days of special effects, uh, they were called film effects. And we re-photograph film in order to make the effects. The early Star Wars, all the effects are, most of them were shot in front of blue screen and it was a film composite process. So the people who worked in special effects ran motion picture cameras, but inside like an office building where the mm. special effects offices were. So I got one of those jobs mm. so I could get a card in the uh, local IATSE 659 union, because at that point in my life, I had aspirations to become a camera, a director of photography, like Conrad Hall and some of the other great camera people I'd met. But uh, my first job on the other side of the camera was a company called Modern Film Effects. Mm -hmm. And we got, I was working on main title sequences for a lot of Paramount films where we would actually re-photograph the titles and then composite them on the film and sometimes add effects. But we got this offbeat film in that was uh, kind of a last ditch project for an, at the time, unknown largely unknown director producer by the name of George Lucas. And George Lucas had started his own special effects company out in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles when 20th Century Fox gave him the money to make the movie, which everybody thought was an absolute joke because it was billed as a Western set in space. And everybody thought, who in the world wants to see a cowboy movie in outer space. This is ridiculous. Equally ridiculous to the theme was the idea that they could do all these special effects in a warehouse in Van Nuys, which they couldn't. They were running so far behind schedule that they started farming out all the special effects to every special effects company in Hollywood that had ever done a movie. And the company I worked at had and we were given the project of trying to come up with the laser beams that would be the light swords. They had mm. shot the film with the actors holding the lightsaber handle and a brightly painted broomstick mm. inside the handle. And there was a process which was very prominent back then and still exists to a certain uh, amount today called rotoscoping, where we would take each frame of film and we would trace literally on a piece of paper on a wall, we'd project each frame on one of these giant sheets of paper and we would trace the broomstick. Mm -hmm. and wherever the broomstick went, we would create uh, what was called a map. And that map was then going to be filled with light. So it looked like 
there was light coming out of the lightsaber. The problem was that when we traced it, each little tracing had slight variations. And so when it was, when we did our first tests, the light was just shaking and it looked phony as all get out. Yeah. And so we thought we have to do something. We kept showing these tests to the editor and a few times to George Lucas, who was dismayed. Mm -hmm. So we redoubled our efforts and we began working late shifts. And one night we were working so late that when we put the mat in the projector to do the composite, we didn't notice that it was way out of focus. Mm -hmm. The next morning when we got the film back from the lab, it looked amazing. Mm. All the jittering was gone because the soft focus gave it that cool look glow that became the signature look of the lightsabers or the light swords. And so it was totally by accident that we solved that problem. And about 90% of the light swords that are in the first Star Wars were done at the company that I worked at and I worked on uh, re-photographing all those mats. It was a, a very interesting story. And of course, the rest of Star Wars is history, but frequently mm -hmm. the kinds of special effects that we created, oftentimes the most inventive stuff was an accident because we were working too late at night. We, we made mistakes that turned out looking great. Mm -hmm. Wow, I was not expecting that, and that's that's crazy. And and you were part of a big team of people that managed to to make this a reality. And the impact of that is truly extraordinary. And that, I did not expect that, but that's that's exactly that answered my question. That's really amazing. The fact that you're able to be in that situation, and of course, learn from that situation, and you know, learn from the mistakes, you were able to make something truly extraordinary. You mentioned in your uh your answer to that that you, from my understanding, you've always wanted to you know do camera work and i'm not really sure if this is relevant to it but later all this experience that you had done uh helped you from my understanding i think it's here you helped um do music videos um you i believe you were a from my understanding maybe director were you directing or producing music videos for mtv both yes both. okay in 19 well one of the people who i became good friends with in my time at modern film effects was a very a uh, talented artist and director and animator from San Francisco. His name was Gary Gutierrez. Mm. And Gary had a company called Colossal Pictures. And one of the things that Gary brought into the company that I worked at for us to help create were these uh, signature logos for a brand new television network that was going to go on the air in 1981 and the network was called MTV mm. and Colossal Pictures did all of the on-air IDs these little three and five second if you ever get a chance to look at the very early ones they were a very cool style of kind of ultra realistic animation it looked like Andy Warhol had designed the logo and it would flash and jump and go all over the place. And we worked with Colossal and I worked with Gary on putting that stuff together. And so once MTV launched, it opened up this huge new area of entertainment called the music video. Mm -hmm. And because I had experience with movies and some of the cool techniques, some of the special effects, that uh, made music videos cutting edge. The early days we were in competition with movies and television and working with much smaller budgets, we had to captivate attention and we had to get you to watch three to four minutes of something that didn't really have a story. We always tried to tell a story, but more important than the story was the look. And so having some experience with special effects and a lot of experience with movies uh, from all different sides, my specialty 
was doing music videos that related to films. And I did quite a few of them. Uh, one of them that stands out in uh, 1985 or 84, 1984, Paramount uh, was spending the most money they had spent in two decades on a special effects picture called Explorers. Mm -hmm. And Explorers was directed by Joe Dante, who was just coming off these huge successes at Warner Brothers on the Gremlins film series. And Explorers is a fantasy film about teenagers who encounter an alien and are transported up into space through these magic bubbles only to find out that the alien has been attracted to earth because he's been listening to radio signals from the 50s. Mm -hmm. And he's playing um, 50s rock and roll in his spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So one of the songs that the filmmakers licensed was a Little Richard song called All Around the World, which was the flip side of an early Little Richard single that was a huge hit called uh, Tutti Frutti. So on the flip side of Tutti Frutti is all around the world. And we had Little Richard uh, signed up to do a music video and we were gonna incorporate some of the actors from the film and some of the scenes. And we got a deal with MTV where MTV guaranteed that they would play this video in what they called power rotation, which meant it would be on every single hour, 24 hours a day for 10 days before the movie opened. That was a huge deal. And the way we got that is I was at Paramount at the time and at Paramount, we agreed to run the music video in movie theaters and to put a big banner on the screen that said, watch the world, watch this world premiere video on MTV. So promoting MTV inside theaters was kind of the holy grail for MTV. And the only problem was the day I went to pick little Richard up at his hotel on sunset, I'm out there with a limo. We are about to make the most expensive music video Paramount's ever made. They had greenlit $500,000. This is in the 80s for a music video, but they have $20 million in this film. So everything matters. And little Richard refuses to come out of his room and come down and make the music video. He tells me he needs an extra $200,000. I call New York. They said, blow it off, we'll recast. A week later, Robert Palmer, from Power Station had agreed to do a cover of the Little Richard single all around the world. And we shot the music video with Robert Palmer. And the music video got power rotation and the movie was a huge flop. Oh. It lost more money than any Paramount picture for 10 years. Darn. Well, I, was I, not blame, here. Little, I blame Little Richard somehow. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> I got to work with um, some very cool and talented uh, musicians who actually did show up. And I, I made a bunch of music videos, including uh, one for The Lion King with Elton John. That was an unbelievable experience. Uh, uh, Glenn Fry from down and out in Beverly Hills, the heat is on, uh, a bunch of music videos for Beverly Hills Cop, mm -hmm. for a Tom Cruise movie at Disney called Cocktail. Uh, it, was, it was an exciting ride and I always had fun making music videos and I always breathed a sigh of relief when the talent made it to the set. Yes, and you mentioned storytelling and what I find fascinating in your timeline is you soon went to uh, do trailers and marketing and things like that and this was a question that actually a friend of mine who was into editing i uh, thought said oh macaulay you should ask ted this question you know so i'll i'll ask you this question so you know there's been projects that you've been in like pretty woman you know helping with like the, the the spots and things like that and you know a lot of editing software and programs are available on the market these days 
and you know there are many content creators who and independent filmmakers who have access to this how exclusive was the access to the programs you know used for editing and creative uh, production and what was the day-to-day -day turnaround for the materials when i first started working on trailers i was at modern video film i i did the effects for a lot of trailers there um and it, at that stage everything was on film everything i mean we worked with work prints that were supplied by the editors and we cut on film and we finish on film mm -hmm. a few years later when i was at paramount we began experimenting with transferring the film to videotape and editing on videotape and so there was a format that sony came out with that was a three-quarter inch cassette called a umatic cassette mm -hmm. And the decks were not too expensive and they were almost frame accurate, not completely, but almost frame accurate. And you could use a CMX editing system to control decks. So you could make nearly frame accurate edits like you could make with film on a film cutting bench. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, um, probably six or seven years, like that's a long time, technology, that's a long time. Uh, we cut trailers on tape and then we would finish them on film. I began working with Disney in 1986 and I worked with them exclusively for seven years. And during the time that I was at Disney, we migrated from editing on tape in what was at that time called linear editing, which meant you had to make one cut at a time. And each time you made an edit, it was recorded onto a piece of tape, and then you made the next edit or dissolve or cut or whatever transition you used. When the first non-linear editing systems came in, the first one was introduced by a company called EMC Squared. And we experimented with EMC squared. We also experimented with another system called two others. One was called Avid, which is kind of an was the industry standard for many years as a non-linear edit platform. There was another one that was uh, created by a company in Hollywood called Laser Pacific, which employed burning film onto laser discs and you would have six to eight laser disc platters spinning at the same time all with the same material on them and you could do non-linear editing by just creating a series of visual edits without actually recording them till you were done we did a lot of experiments with laser edit uh, ultimately we went with avid and later on, uh, we moved into the digital realm. We still use Avid to an extent. We started using Final Cut. Uh, uh, Adobe Premiere made its way under the scene a few years back. There's another platform called Resolve. Yes. They're all non-linear platforms and they all look pretty much the same. And you tell your story by creating a timeline below the picture. And that timeline really looks like an old work print of film. Back when I first started and learned about editing, we would take a grease pencil and we would make marks on the film and we would physically cut it and splice it together with tape. So a dissolve was a long diagonal line. A cut was a C with a line through it where the cut occurred. And that's not too different from what the timeline looks like today, but it, it's all it's all digital now. Uh, yeah. One quick story about making trailers. Yes. Um, I was enormously successful at making trailers. When I got to Disney, um, they offered me an exclusive contract only to work for Disney. And I did that for seven years. And I had a staff of 40 people, some incredibly talented people. But we used to tell everyone, because a lot of people thought, if I get into trailers, I can direct films in a year or two. It's just, I'll make a trailer or two, and then I'll get my Academy Award. 
And I had to explain to people, that's not going to happen. You might get an Academy Award, but you're going to learn a craft here. And our craft is we make long things short. Mm -hmm. That's our craft. We learn to tell stories. And we get a two, sometimes three hour rough cut. And we have to reduce that down to anywhere from 90 seconds to two minutes. And one of the projects I was given when I was working for Disney fairly early on in my run with them was a movie called 3000. And 3000 was the story of a very rich guy played by Richard Gere, who offered a prostitute played by Julia Roberts $3,000 to spend the week with him while he's staying in a hotel in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a dark film. Yeah. There were a lot of drugs in it. Um, it. It didn't really seem like a lighthearted romantic comedy when we got the first cut. Mm -hmm. The first instructions we got from the studio because they intended to release this film as a Disney film. They had two labels at the time. They could release film under Touchstone or under Disney. Mm -hmm. But they wanted this to be a Disney film. Mm. And so uh, they said, so no matter what, this is not a film about a prostitute. Ooh. And I bit my lip and went back to the office and we started making cuts and everything we did was the story of a prostitute. We just, we just couldn't solve this. Mm -hmm. And one day, one of our editors came in and said, I want to play a piece of music for you. And I said, okay. I said, what's this for? And he goes, well, it's for 3000. I said, oh, we need help on that. What have you got? And he plays this old Roy Orbison song, Pretty Woman. And he says, picture this song with Julia Roberts walking down Rodeo Drive shopping. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's a shopping movie. It's a fairy tale. This has nothing to do with a prostitute and a guy paying her money. It's every girl's dream come true. She goes shopping in all the cool stores on Road Air Drive. And I said, Richard, you've solved it. That's it. Can we license this song? He goes, let's call. We got a deal with the publisher of the music for $30,000 to license Pretty Woman. We put our trailer together. We took it to the studio. They went bonkers. They said, this is it. You've solved it. It's fantastic. Can we get the song? And I said, we've already got a licensing deal in place. $30,000 and you own it. They said, no, not, not the music. We want the title. Ooh. I said, the title? They said, oh, yeah, we're going to call the movie Pretty Woman. Huh. That movie made more money as a live action film than any film that Disney had released since Mary Poppins. And on the strength of the success of that movie marketing campaign, we got about 90% of Disney's films for the next five years. It was unbelievable. It was like the floodgates open. And they always said to us, come up with more songs that we can rename our movies. So the very next movie they sent us was a project called Boy Rinse Girl. And we renamed it can't buy me love and license to Beatles song. And that movie did extraordinary. I think it was Elizabeth Shue's first uh, big, big hit. Wow. Cool. That's, that's my experience in the world of movie trailers. Movie marketing became the hands-on uh, playground of studio executives, not just marketing, but production executives. Mm -hmm. They frequently couldn't control the directors and writers and producers they hired, but they certainly could control the trailer makers. And if you were willing to be controlled, it was a fabulous run. I mean, yeah. uh, we had filmmakers who used to come into my office at Paramount and look at their trailers and shake their heads and say, there goes five years of my life. You know, if you were a movie maker and you made a flop, it could take you five years to get back on your feet. With movie trailers, there's always another one right outside the door. And we had no shortage of work and 
great projects and great people to work with. Mm -hmm. And trailers are so, so, so important. And I feel like you're talking about music. Uh, music is a big part of trailers nowadays. And uh, I love trailers. Um, I didn't tell you this. I don't know if you know this about me, but I love stories. I actually have a little small pocket-sized book of stories that I've created since I was a kid that I would love to see into films and stuff. And I often envision these stories. I close my eyes. I imagine them as trailers and I can see the shots and stuff like that. And that's kind of how I processed my, my stories. But it's just super cool. And you mentioned, you know, telling a story in a short period of time. And that, and I'm not sure if you know a lot about it, but social media nowadays, people are creating and releasing like 30 second, I guess you could call it shorts and videos involving topics of varieties of things. And they got to tell a story. You got to hook them in. And so it's really cool to hear about you and trailers. Trailers is super fascinating. And I know th further down the timeline, you got into a lot of other really cool stuff, kind of wrapping up the, this, the, your life, you know, you went into executive producing and I don't exactly know what quite, an, what quite an executive producer looks like, but I wanted to just kind of hear, you know, being an executive producer, being involved, you, you gave me a list of really cool projects and there was a lot of interesting things there but just through your journey as an executive producer what is one memorable moment that you can share that just like you know comes to mind that was like wow that was that was amazing that really impacted me uh indulge me for one second when i was a kid mm -hmm. my favorite cartoon strip in the newspaper was peanuts mm -hmm. the charles schultz comic strip and every sunday i looked forward to seeing the full color Charlie Brown comic strip. Mm -hmm. And my favorite one was when I was about 10 years old in September, there was a comic strip in which Charlie Brown goes back to school. He's been off all summer and his teacher assigns the class to write the essay that probably every school kid has had to write at some point, how I spent my summer vacation. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Brown writes this incredibly flowery, um, total bullshit uh, essay on how he spent his summer <laughs> vacation, including like, and all those idle days of summer had nothing to compare to the wondrous excitement of returning to the sacred halls of learning here at school and being in the presence of our wise and wonderful teachers. Mm -hmm. And the teacher walks around the class and collects all the papers. And she looks at Charlie Brown's and she reads it obviously quickly and says, Charlie Brown, brilliant work, young man, A plus. And the last cell in the strip is Charlie kicked back at his desk in his class with his feet up. And he looks wisely to camera and says, as the years go by, you learn what sells. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the essence of what an executive producer does. Mm. An executive producer learns what sells. Mm. And so you have to combine the art of storytelling, recognizing talent and getting other people to give you the money to make the stories, whether it's a network or a studio or a streaming platform, an executive producer gets the idea, gets the team, and gets the money. Mm. That's beautiful. That that really explains a lot. And that's really helpful. And that makes a lot more sense. And we we definitely need a lot of executive producers out there and producers in general, because there's so many, so many stories out there, so many ideas and concepts that could truly change the world and impact a lot of lives. And you've you've gone through a lot, you've worked through a lot. And this is kind of wrapping up. And I love to ask, you know, with such a diverse and accomplished career spanning acting, producing music videos, marketing hit movies, and now developing, you know, I believe your original series is, um, I, I'm curious to know which aspect of your journey has been the most fulfilling and personal grati uh, personally gratifying for you. Looking back, is there any particular role or project that stands out to you as your favorite and holds a special place in your heart? And what about this experience made it so memorable and fulfilling for you? Just your entire life, all these amazing opportunities that have had happened or will happen. I think my side of the mountain for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about is Canada. Mm -hmm. And I've had a love affair with Canada since I was a kid. I've gotten to go up to Canada and work there. I worked on films in Canada when I was behind the camera. My first television series was produced in Canada. Um, I just have this natural affinity for Canada and Canadians. That mm -hmm. I, I, my 
ancestors of my family all come from Quebec. So I guess I'm genetically predisposed to like Canada. Mm -hmm. My side of the mountain was a, a transformative experience because it allowed me to see so many different aspects of Hollywood from making a movie to the post-production side. As I mentioned, we were in London re-recording the soundtrack and I found out all the working parts of how you actually edit a film and put it together. And then being out on the road, promoting and selling it, I was with publicists and I learned so much firsthand about how you market a movie and what marketing is all about. So uh, certainly I would say my side of the mountain, uh, there were other experiences that were memorable in different ways, but uh, I think I also relate to the character I played in my side of the mountain. I, I, I'm sure I was cast in that role because I was very much like that little boy. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a stretch to play that role. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned from that movie that, you know, you need a mentor when you're in Hollywood. Nobody does this alone. This isn't that once every hundred years, there's an Orson Welles who's a total auteur who can do everything on his own. But for all the rest of us, we need help. We need a guide. We need somebody to teach us the ropes. And having a mentor and the producer of that film was a man by the name of Robert Radness, who was a mentor to me for the rest of my career in so many ways and such a, a lifelong influence that that film stands out. And finding a mentor is the advice I share with everybody who says, how do I get a career in Hollywood? You find a mentor. Exactly. And that, that actually ends on a perfect note because I always ask what you want to pass on to the listeners. And that's absolutely perfect. Having a mentor is very important. I, I, I do a bit of music, my a bit of music production and uh, having a mentor was super valuable for me because learning how to make music and learning how to uh, produce digital music, it, just having a mentor is super valuable in any, in any sort of way in life. But I really appreciate uh, sitting down with you today and hearing your story. And it was just super excellent hearing your, your story and your life. And it really impacted me. And I think it will impact um, a lot of other people. So thank you so much. 